So today we're starting a new series on spiritual intelligence. Spiritual intelligence, at least as it's defined by Cindy Wigglesworth in her book, SQ21, is this. It is our ability to behave with wisdom and compassion while maintaining inner peace regardless of the situation. Think about that for a minute. It's our ability to behave with wisdom and compassion from this place of inner peace, regardless of what might be swirling around. I need a little more intelligence in that area. I don't know about you. And it sounds like, at least to me, the perfect summary of the Sermon on the Mount. To behave, to live to express with wisdom and compassion while maintaining inner peace. But before we delve into how we spiritually evolve, what that looks like, what the practices are, how we can use this to become greater expressions of what we would call our inner Christ, I want to just lay a foundation of how this fits within all of our intelligences. Because we're waking up that we do have multiple intelligence. It's not just this brain that's up here. There are intelligences that we can tap into that give us a greater capacity to live into this ideal. The first is physical intelligence. This one's been around for a long time. She defines it as body awareness and skillful use. We've been evolving this over 250,000 years or so. Certainly at first, our primary focus with physical intelligence is how we stay safe and how we survive. How do we get enough food and water and care that we need to keep this physical organism alive. Now it's really shifted. Our physical intelligence is all about longevity and health and how we can create that in ourselves. And it's really monitored and run by what we call our reptilian brain, the earliest brain that we have that really gave us the intelligence to be able to survive the many challenges that we as humankind have faced. Then we've got IQ, intellectual quotient as they call it, the measuring tool of our brain, our intellect's ability. It's really measured by how well we are able to reason and to memorize and to process information, to solve puzzles. And this brain intelligence has been evolving now we're estimating anywhere between five and 10,000 years, where we've really developed this prefrontal cortex that gives us this increased brain capacity in which to engage in life. And it has certainly taken us and changed our world in huge and dynamic ways the more we have been able to develop and increase and evolve our intelligence. Emotional intelligence, we talked about that a few months ago, is pretty new. It relates to our interpersonal skills. It, it is a measurement of how emotionally we are aware as we go through our daily lives. It is our capacity for empathy, for emotional self-management. And it really rose out of psychology. It's been around about 100 years. Emotional intelligence, this idea of it, framing it in that way, maybe only about 30 years. And in the awarenesses that we have of the brain, I would call this the heart brain. We've kind of had this inkling that there is information, a capacity that the heart gives us that we can't get from the other intelligences. And finally, this new way of thinking about, of engaging with this human spiritual journey is spiritual intelligence. And again, it's that ability to behave with wisdom and compassion while maintaining inner peace. It's only been around for a couple of decades. 
It's in its very early evolutionary stages. And it is what I would call located in, we've called it the intuitive brain, the gut brain. I love in Paul Smith's inter, integral Christianity, he calls it the spiritual womb. But it's located typically in that part of your belly where you just know something, but you don't know how you know it. And it requires a sufficient level, not an expertise, not a mastering of, but a basic level of development at these lower. You notice it's kind of a, a pyramid. It's, we've got foundational pieces on there. So we have to have some level of physical and intellectual capacities before we can even begin to think about emotional intelligence and spiritual intelligence. It'd be difficult, I think, to focus on. If somebody came in and they were living on the street and we were talking about, you know, upping their spiritual intelligence or emotional intelligence, when they're just worried about where they're going to sleep tonight or how they're going to feed their bodies. When you're in that mode, that's the mode that you have to be focused on because until that's sort of taken care of, it's difficult. You, it's, it would be difficult for somebody who didn't have the ability to learn how to read and write and deal with money to navigate in our world. In both those instances, you're still sort of in that reptilian survival mode. So you can't really get there until you have some basic mastery, at least at a survival um, easily survivable level before you can move on. And I imagine that that's really not the audience I'm talking to, so we're going to focus a little bit on these and see how we can begin to understand and then put them in to practice in our lives so that we can continue to evolve and be able to manage, because I think we need all these brains as the world gets more and more complex, as the world, as what we have to grapple with and, and make decisions around becomes difficult in this global, instantaneous AI, don't even know, you know, I'm at the point where I don't even know what to trust anymore because we have created through our abilities the capacity to put whatever we want out there and not know what its sources are or whether it's factual. We looked at emotional intelligence. I'm really not going to spend much time on it except for a quick review. Um, and you can go back and watch if you missed those parts in June. Um, it's, it's good to at least begin to be aware and then start taking a look at where, where am I? How how well am I able to be conscious of and even self-manage my own emotions and to be conscious of and understand emotions as they show up in the larger population and engage with those? In that model, there was 18 skills of emotional intelligence. I think Nick's going to put up a chart for me. And they focused on both the inner and the outer and the individual and the collective. Uh, you, you know, you can, you can go out and find, oh wait, that's the wrong one. I don't know why, that's spiritual intelligence. Well, you, we've, we've looked at them, oh there you go, there's emotional intelligence. So it's about our own self-awareness, it's, it's about our awareness of others, it's about our own self-management, and then how are we able to put that into relationship with other people. It is about adaptability. It is about our ability to show up authentically. And it gives us the capacity for empathy. It opens the door for greater collaboration and it becomes a change catalyst in and of itself. And we need some basic EQ, as you're gonna see, before we can really be focused on our spiritual intelligence. And many of you have been at this a long time and will see some of these things as similar and things that you've worked on over time. So the author of the 21 Skills of Spiritual Intelligence, her name is Cindy Wigglesworth. She is a Unity Truth student. She, she attended and I think still attends the Unity Church in Houston for decades and has been like 
many of us to many workshops, followed many different spiritual um, leaders and ideas and engaged. And after decades of really being in this spiritual quest of understanding, of meditation, of positive psychology, even this emotional intelligence, she was, you know, very familiar with that. She figured there has to be some quantitative way similar to emotional intelligence that we can apply at spiritual, at the spiritual level. She goes on to say, though, you know, it's difficult and, and it takes some um, awareness to even understand how would we measure intelligence? You know, if when we're looking at IQ, they have different math skills and different processing and reasoning skills that they can do it. But how do we do that? That was her big question. And what are the skills that would demonstrate that you have a greater capacity of spiritual intelligence? I'm not going to get into her whole methodology. She hired many people. They tried to do this as scientifically <coughs> and with the rigors that other studies are being done. So you can, she talks about that a little bit in her book, um, and you can go out and read more about that. But she makes very clear that this is not really about measuring spirit. It's not trying to measure how much spirit there is in one or even define what that is because as many of us have discovered and the saints and the sages and the mystics said that is undefinable. It's, there aren't the right words, there aren't the right symbols, there aren't the right examples that can really do justice other than just our own experience of it. But then trying to explain it, it, it falls short of what that would look like. So she came up with these 21 skills. Skills that we can develop, skills that we can practice, and that support us in filling our need to be connected to something larger, to understand and then demonstrate the divinity, the oneness, the unity that is already present in our world, despite all appearances, and to be in that quest for something divine or noble. I imagine most of you are sitting here because that there's a calling. I, I want to know more. I want to experience more. I want to continue to grow and be the best human being having this, or spiritual being having this human experience. So she used the models in many respects of emotional intelligence, but then switched it up. So, Nick, can you put that one up, the spiritual intelligent one? Because in this, you know, again, we have our four quadrants. And I kind of like the way she puts this. The top left is what you see, your inner world, your perceptions, beliefs, and awarenesses. And then the universal awareness is um, how you see the world, what your worldview is. And then the bottom is how others see you. If you were asking people to describe you, would they see you in the same way that you see yourself? And then how that outpictures out into the greater um, uh, social and, and engagement with the world. So we're going to be looking at these over the next several weeks. And one I wanted to focus on today, one of the skills that she says are necessary, especially for our own self-awareness, but then even if we want to use that, that awareness out for good in, in the way we engage in the world, is the ability to, dis, to distinguish between our ego voice, for lack of a better word, and, our, and the voice of our higher self. How many of you ever experienced that you've got, we've probably got many voices going on in that head, but at least those two, you know, that we have this ego that's telling us what, you know, how we should move through and react to something, and then we have the voice of wisdom and reason sometimes it shows up for me. And they can sometimes be having a conversation. I don't know if you ever had that, but you know, when you're, when you're uh, trying to make a decision, you got a couple of different trains of thought going on in there. And just to be able to, usually the higher voice is much quieter. You have to listen a little bit more intently to hear that voice. Ego 
it's not necessarily bad. I mean, I think some pe that kind of became the trend for, well, we want to kill our ego. We want to, you know, get rid of the ego so that this higher self can have more dominion over our thoughts and our feelings and our beliefs and the way we show up. But it's really there and does a necessary service for us. The challenge is how can we move that ego part that is normally driving the car over into the passenger seat and just let it be a navigator so that the higher self is, to determ is determining the journey, not the ego self. And it's not easy to do, but that's part of this call to evolve into more spiritually intelligent beings. And it begins with practicing and connecting with this inner higher self. So that's what we're going to do here in the next few moments as we move into our time of meditation, of quietness, of turning our attention inward, is to see if we can't clearly recognize, hear, and appreciate the voice of the higher self as well as the voice of the ego and get them to be moving in the same direction. So I would invite you now, just wherever you're at, to sort of get comfortable. Sometimes it helps if you close your eyes, but you can certainly just focus on some point in the room, soften your gaze. As you begin to bring your attention and your awareness inward. Moving your attention to your breath as it naturally and easily flows in and out of your body. Just notice how it feels, the sensations of that air moving in through your nostrils and then out again. Notice and become aware of your body and how it feels in this moment. And if there's any tension anywhere, as you take that next breath in and let it go, just letting go, seeing that stress just exit out of your body. And I invite you in this time of quiet connection and awareness to bring into your mind's eye something that you're looking for greater clarity around or seeking to make a decision about. Just bring it in and let all of the thoughts, not trying to control them, just whatever thoughts come with that, let them just move around. And that part of our being there where our brain is, that part in our head where we tend to process everything. Just let them float and move. And imagining that your head has a fishbowl around it containing all of these thoughts. And at the very bottom there is a flap and as that flap opens and drops down, all of those thoughts begin to move, to swim through every part of your body. Let them go wherever they choose to go and notice where and how they might be showing up in your physical being. As they move and swim through the center of your chest, Notice those thoughts being infused with that heart intelligence. And then imagine that all those thoughts are gently, gently sinking down until they come to rest at the bottom of your pelvic. The spiritual womb 
And in this place, they grow quiet. They rest, they are at peace. And now these thoughts begin to rise up out of there. But now, instead of swimming wherever they choose, they are a school, like a school of fish. They now, in concert, move in and throughout your body as one, synchronized, energized, joy-filled. And as they are moving through your entire being and all of your intelligences, just sit and listen and see what the higher voice has to share about that situation that you initially brought into your mind and heart or just see the wisdom that it's offering in this moment as you listen for a few moments in the silence. And as you slowly begin to bring your attention back to this time and space, you let this unified thought process continue to move in and through your body and your mind, your heart, your intuitive intelligence. And even if nothing arises in this moment, you trust that it will show up in the right moment in the right time and in the right place. Aware now again of the body as it's supported by the chair that you're sitting in, wiggling your toes and fingers, bringing all of your attention back to this time and place. With another deep breath, and then whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes. All right, take another deep breath with me now. Because I'm going to shift gears on you just a little bit. You know, right now, there is an active, and I would say sometimes contentious discussion happening between ministers and other leaders in our movement about whether unity identifies as Christian or spiritual. Those are kind of the two running things. And it seems that much like everything else that's arising, at least in our country, we got about a 50-50 split. <laughs> Some people say, absolutely, we are Christian, that's how I identify, and this is our Christian roots, and we need to stay with them. And there are many others that say, I really like spiritual, because Christian comes with certain understandings depending on how you talk to them and we don't fit into that traditional mold anyway of Christianity. I imagine if we took a poll right now and I'm not going to because I don't like to see 50-50. I like, I like to see oneness. But I imagine that we've got people sitting in here, some that lean sort of in that more traditional role of unity because certainly that's where our roots are and there are some that you know feel and and get to experience this from a very spiritual perspective love the teachings of Jesus but really identify as more spiritual and I imagine I have an active imagination that there may be some of you asking 
why are we talking about emotional and spiritual intelligence instead of focusing on Jesus' and Unity's teachings, those core teachings? This question has certainly come up more than once for me over the decades because I tend to like a wide variety. I, I have a, a robust diet in my spiritual journey, so I, and I tend to share that. And I've had that question asked me, why are we doing this? You know, I thought we were here to really focus on, you know, these teachings that are the core part of unity. And as I've pondered that question, it occurred to me, I imagined if Jesus were to show up on the earth today to share this message, which I think is an eternal message, would he use the same language, the same examples, the same ideas as he did to the audience that he was speaking to a couple thousand years ago? I don't think that he would be saying the kingdom of heaven is like and then talking about maybe to the farmers, maybe when he was speaking to the farmers he'd talk about planting seeds, but when he's talking about to the business people he'd be talking about some other new business integral way that we can collaborate and be unified and be as one. I imagine that he might say something like, the kingdom of heaven is like shifting the ego into the navigation seat and allowing the higher self to drive the car. I imagine that he would say, the kingdom of heaven is like living from a place of wisdom and compassion, from inner peace, regardless of the circumstances. In fact, that is exactly what he demonstrated to us, that ability to be in that place of compassion for everyone, to act from the wisest course while maintaining that place of inner peace. peace. I don't think it's either or, I think it's both and. And while you're here, you're probably gonna get both. <laughs> you know, Jesus' Beatitudes were an invitation to those listening to examine their values and suggest to them the values that would bring about the kingdom of heaven. Humility, compassion, Perseverance, peace, service, generosity, kindness, trust. And spiritual intelligence invites us to do the very same. That's one of the self-awareness's pieces that are part of this process in which we can develop greater and greater intelligence is to gain clarity about what we value and compare that to how others view us as our values and to do our best to make them in sync. You know, we're really good at saying, this is what I value, but we're not always following it up and demonstrating it by what we say and what we do and how we act and how we can get them to show up in greater and greater ways. Places where we might even be called to shift our values and then step into the journey of how we live into them. So your invitation for this week is to pay attention as much as you can to this inner world and to see if you can recognize that higher self when it's speaking and then listen to it. It's one thing to just recognize it. It's another thing to actually go, huh, let me find the value of what this higher self is trying to share with me. If you want to go a little deeper on this, we don't have any books. Amazon is out, except you can get the Kindle version. But she has a website called deepchange.com, and you can order a book from there. She does assessments. She has coaches, all, all sorts of stuff. So you can go and check that out if you're interested in wanting for your own spiritual growth to go into this a little deeper. The bottom line is this. The more practiced that we become, the more we will see and experience life that Jesus called the kingdom of heaven, which is really about seeing life 
through the eyes of God, through the eyes of love. Well, it is our opportunity now to share of our financial good with our ministry. We are so grateful for the many channels in which we receive our good. And I wanted to spend just a moment to give you an update. I know Mary mentioned we usually do it on the first Sunday, but I wasn't here about an extra opportunity to uh, donate to help reduce our loan payment. And I just wanted to give you some stats about that right now, because right now, we are about at 79,000 is what our line of credit is up to based on having to replace multiple air conditioners and this excess insurance that we're having to pay through the high risk market because of the claim we had a few years ago. I'm hoping, praying that maybe next year that will fall off of our record and, and we'll be able to get to a more reasonable level, but that's where we're at right now. And the board has agreed to um, put at least 1500 towards that each month, um, more if we have it in the general fund, and then whatever else comes in. And right now that's usually about three to $400 of people giving a little extra donation um, to help reduce the loan. And so I wanted this morning to ask you to consider doing an additional contribution. If we have, and, and we typically have, I think, about 80 people active in our ministry. But if 60 people could do an extra $10 a month, that's an extra $7,200 a year that the loan gets reduced. Um, if some can stretch it to $20 a month, that's $20 a month is not 15000 a year that the loan gets reduced. So I just ask you to consider that. And if you can do that to do it automatically and to make sure you designate it that is for the reduction of the loan or loan payment or something other than general fund. And I recognize that not everybody can do that. They're either on a limited budget or right now they don't have it in their budget to share any extra. So here's something that you can do that I'd like you to consider. So we have our birthday banquet coming up. It's October the 19th. And we got lots of fun things planned. Your team has been working hard on that. It's going to be more open. It's going to have less activities. We will have a shortened live auction as well as a silent auction this year. So something that won't cost you anything is to go and ask those people and services that you frequent or other um, people that you're willing to reach out to and ask if they would be willing to donate something towards our live and silent auction. And for those of you who can, buy a ticket. <laughs> We're at, we've actually increased the ticket $5 more this year per person, and that $5 is again there to reduce the loan payments. And everything that, any profit that comes in is all going to reduce. That's our big focus. It's our last big fundraiser of the year. And plan to do your Christmas shopping when you show up, because you know, the more we raise through these live and silent auctions, it goes towards reducing the loan payment. So know that however you can support us, we are so grateful. We continue to open ourselves up to known and unknown channels. Sometimes money just shows up out of the blue. So we hold that open as a possibility. One of these days, the IRS is gonna get, us, get around to giving us our earned Retain, retained earned credit or whatever it is that the government was ask, um, offering as part of COVID. And that's a significant amount, but you know, it's been close to a year. We, you know, one of these days, you can hold that prayer too, that they're gonna actually process it and send us the money. But we bless all that comes in. We bless and we know there's always enough. We live in an abundant universe and there is enough. We live in that space and bless it. So join with me as we hold in our hands or in the energy of the hands that we clasp together and in our hearts and bless all that comes in and moves through this ministry together. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, Father, Mother God. All right, let's yeah. stand and let's stand. join hands join and stand. hearts as we sing our peace song.
into this week seeking to be wise and compassionate as we find our inner peace. We go knowing our prayer for protection. We'll do it as a call and response together. Or no, first me. The light of God surrounds us. I am the light of God. The love of God enfolds us. I am the love of God. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Together, wherever we are, God is and all is well.